are one movement, one people, one family, and one glorious nation under God. And together, we will make America powerful again. We will make America wealthy again. We will make America strong again. We will make America proud again. And we will make America great again. Yes, we will, friends. Yes, we must. And if you ever have trouble convincing your friends or fellow voters that we are fighting against tyranny when we fight against the Democrat Party, well, today we're going to give you some more uh, talking points to to convince them, especially around one issue in particular uh, that we don't talk about a lot on this program. We'll bring that to you in a moment. Uh, first, of course, though, the Word of God is a beautiful prayer that Nehemiah says at the beginning of the book of Nehemiah. And uh, it's a prayer that we can apply to our nation today as we work to save this country. We've got seven months to turn things around. It's gone way, way, way too far, and yet not too far to save. We can turn it around in this election. Maybe our last chance to turn it around as uh, without it becoming 100 times more difficult uh, and uh, yet uh, here we are. This is what we have to do. So I want to read this prayer of Nehemiah. It comes to us in the first chapter of the book, starting uh, in verse uh, 5. Nehemiah said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes be open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you, day and night, for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I, my father's house, have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though you're dispersed be under the farthest skies, I will gather them from there and bring them back to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name. Give success to your servant today and grant him mercy. Let us pray. Lord God, we have sinned. We, your disciples, in America, acknowledge our sins, and we ask for the grace always to acknowledge our sins with humility and with trust in your mercy. Because unless and until your people turn from their evil ways, they will not experience the fullness of your blessing. Lord, we ask you to bless this nation, but the first thing that we need you to bless us with is precisely that spirit of repentance that recognizes our, our sins that recognizes our corruption and enables us to turn away from it so that you might purify us and we might walk in newness of life. Lord, this is part of making America great, making America holy, making America repentant, making America turn to you, turn away from evil, rise up from corruption. Lord, we pray that grace upon our entire nation, every one of its institutions, every one of its leaders, every one of its citizens. Cl cleanse us, purify us, strengthen us, make us holy, and give us new hope. Let us begin, Lord God, in these next seven months, a new chapter in American history. This is no less important than that. A new chapter in American history. Enable it, Lord, just as you enabled uh, 
new chapter in the life of your people Israel when they came back from the exile, when they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem, when they renewed their hope that you would send the Savior from among their midst. You did that, and we rejoice now in his salvation. Bless America. Bless our efforts for America. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. So look, you believe that we're under tyranny right now, right? We're under a police state. The Democrat Party, they're a bunch of tyrants. This is no longer an issue of, uh, oh, they have different ideas, different policies, different positions. They're tyrants. They don't believe in freedom. What in the world is Biden trying to do with this student loan forgiveness garbage? There's no such thing as forgiving a loan. A loan always gets paid. The question is who's going to pay for it? And you've heard other commentators talk about this. And Dan Bongino was talking about it just the other day. You, you don't, you don't, it's not, oh, hey, you don't have to pay. Okay, kids over here, don't worry. You don't have to repay it. Yeah, but then do we do. We do. There's no forgiveness of a loan. There's just payment by a different person. And I bring that up because Biden has been told by the Supreme Court that he, as president, doesn't have authority to do this. And what does he say? I will find a way to work around it anyway, you know, playing up to, uh, he's losing the youth vote more and more. And that's one of the key demographics that the Democrats depend upon, together with the Latinos, who's losing votes from them, and the blacks, and he's losing votes from them. So it's like anything he can do, this is all political. Oh, hey, hey, kids, hey, kids wait, uh, don't worry. We'll find a way around it. Around what? The Constitution that you swore an oath to uphold? You see the problem here. Well, I want to talk about a different issue, kind of related, but a distinct issue. Going back now to our study of the book, The Democrat Party Hates America by Mark Levin. Now, hopefully... By now, because we've been talking about this book for a long time, you've gotten your copy and either have read through it or are reading through it. So I want to refer to the section in his chapter on the Democrat Party hates the Constitution, because this is a constitutional issue that I want to review with you here. And that is the section starting on page 301 about the debt, the national debt the debt ceiling in particular. How much more debt can we accrue as a nation? Part of making America great again is to stop this out of control, what would you call it, digging of digging ourselves into a hole that we, we can't get out of, a hole of debt. It's like, can't we get control of ourselves? I mean, ultimately, this comes down to a spiritual discipline. Is, is, is the bottom line. There's a lot of experts on economic matters that can comment on this, and there's constitutional issues that we will raise here in a moment. But ultimately, it's a spiritual issue of uh, just get control of ourselves. We can't just keep spending and spending and then printing more money to, to try to uh, make up for it. Okay. The debt ceiling. Oh, what does this have to do with making America great, winning the election, and so Because it's to make a simple point here, that the Democrats are tyrants, and we have to oppose Democrat tyranny. One of the ways they express their tyranny, and I just gave the example of the student loan, quote, forgiveness, of which is a myth anyway, that we should say theft, theft from us, the people. But here's the point. They're tyrants because they're constantly trying to arrogate to themselves, and particularly I'm talking about the executive branch now, whoever the Democrat person is. Yeah, Biden's the worst president we've ever had, but it's like fill in the blank because this is a problem, and we got to keep thinking this way, systemic to the party. You can fill in the blank. If Biden ends up dropping out by necessity because of health, who knows what's going to happen. I think probably that's the only way that that's going to happen because there's no willingness on his part and the party is divided about what would happen next if you try to force him out and on and on. We've had that discussion. 
My point is fill in the blank. It doesn't matter. There's a systemic problem with the party that they arrogate power to themselves that the Constitution doesn't give them. And if the Constitution doesn't give it to them, that means we don't give it to them. Our government was founded in such a way that those in, quote, power, quote, authority, only have authority that we consent to, period. We consent, otherwise they don't have it. And this is the distinction between freedom and tyranny. In tyranny, they don't care if we consent or not. All right, two preliminary points. The Democrats are addicted to insatiable spending and borrowing. And again, Mark Levin goes into this in beautiful, documented detail. But the Democrats are insatiable, spending and borrowing. And secondly, various government agencies who keep track of all this, for example, the GAO, you know what the GAO is, the Government Accountability Office, they tell us the following. Debt held by the public is projected to grow at a faster pace than the size of the whole economy. Let me say that again. Debt held by the public is projected to grow at a faster pace than the size of the entire economy. Now, I want to explain what the Democrats, and again, it's a systemic problem. So whoever ends up being, the look, apply this to all across the board. Whoever ends up being the the nominee on the Democrat side, likely to be Biden. Others say, no, it's not likely to be Biden. Whoever it is, this applies. It also applies to other Democrat candidates. You can look at Democrat senators. Look at the Senate races, key important Senate races that we have to win in places like Arizona, Pennsylvania, Montana, Ohio. West Virginia, these are all places we can can get Senate seats. It's going to be an issue with these senators, too. It's an issue with congressmen who are running on the Democrat ticket. This is an issue across the board. The Democrats, I want to focus in on something they believe here about the national debt and the debt ceiling, that we, Mark Levin, very effectively refutes this point. We've got to, I want to just equip you on how to talk about it. A couple of key points, okay. What they maintain, these Democrats, these tyrants, is that the Constitution requires that the debt ceiling, okay, the limit, be raised without limit. Instead of doing what? Reduce the budget. Stop the excessive spending and borrowing. Reduce the budget. But no, they say the Constitution actually requires that the debt ceiling just keep being raised higher and higher. Here's the simple point. No, it does not. And let's explore this a little bit more deeply. Okay, we're going to get into some of the weeds here. But this is important. And you can distill this into some very key talking points. Democrats addicted to spending and borrowing. And they believe we've got to just keep raising the debt ceiling Constitution, they think, requires it. They don't know the Constitution, their left hand from their right, okay? They don't know it. What do they go to to try to make this case? The 14th Amendment. Oh, they find a lot of stuff in the 14th Amendment that isn't there. 14th Amendment, Section 4, let me read what it says. This was ratified, <clears throat> uh, this amendment was, in 1868, right after the Civil War, and here's what it says. Section 4. The validity of the public debt of the United States, authorized by law, including debts incurred for payment of pensions and bounties, for services in suppressing insurrection or rebellion, shall not be questioned. But neither the United States nor any state shall assume or pay any debt or obligation incurred in aid of insurrection or rebellion against the United States, or any claim for the loss or emancipation of any slave. But all such debts, obligations, and claims shall be held illegal and void. Okay. So our response to the Democrats using this provision of the Constitution as an argument that the debt ceiling has to continuously be raised. Number one, nobody's questioning the validity of the public debt. That's what this is talking about. The validity of the public debt shall not be questioned. We're not questioning the validity of it. No one's challenging that. 
point number one. Number two, there is not a general statement here of authority for the executive branch to pay this debt. It's not what it says. And it says nothing about changing the way that the Constitution already provides for how the federal government is going to pay debt. In other words, as usual, the Democrats are making things up in their imagination. It's not talking about the executive branch coming along and, hey, let's just take it upon ourselves to do this, raise this debt ceiling. Let's let's read more specifically what the Constitution does say about the payment of debts. Now we go, instead of the 14th Amendment, we go to actually Article 1 of the Constitution. And what does the Constitution start with? Okay, you know, we have three branches of government, right? The executive, the presidency, the legislative, the Congress, the judicial, the courts, Supreme Court, and other courts. Okay. But in the structure of the Constitution, what do they deal with first? Which branch of government do they start talking about first, right at the outset of the Constitution? You know, right? Article 1? It's about the Congress, the legislative branch. Here's what Article 1 says in Section 8. The Congress shall have power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and general welfare of the United States. But all duties, imposts, and excises shall be uniform throughout the United States to borrow money on the credit of the United States, and then it continues. Okay. You see where they put the power and the method to pay the debt. There is no support in the legislative history of of any of this that um, uh, what the Democrats are saying is the case. And by the way, there's this little thing called the separation of powers. So when the president gets up to say anything, you know what, we've always got... This is one of the things we have to be very mindful of, and we've always got to bring this to the attention of our fellow voters. Anytime you hear the president saying something about what he's going to do, one of the thoughts that should cross your mind is separation of powers. Does he even have the authority to do what he's saying? You don't just ask, you know, we have to train our fellow citizens on this. You don't just ask, is what he's saying, does it sound good? That's one question that many people are asking. Or does it benefit me? Is it going to be good for me and for my family? Okay, well, you know, it's fair enough to ask those questions. But does he have the authority to do it in the first place? That's more and more a necessary question to ask. And if so, if he has the authority, where's that authority coming from? Is it coming from the Constitution? Or does the Constitution, see, the Democrats do this all the time. Does the Constitution give that authority to someone else? Look at look at elections, okay? We've talked about this over and over. Free and fair elections, election integrity. What do we see them doing with elections? Arrogating to themselves the, 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 the For the People Act, which is really the For the Politicians Act. Remember they tried to pull this nonsense to federalize control of elections? What were they trying to do? At least they introduced a bill. But if the president or if uh, some other official, election official or a secretary of state, for example, tries changing election laws, and there's been a lot of reform in election laws, thanks be to God, we have to step in and say, wait a second. Again, that question needs to cross our mind. Do you have the authority to do what you're doing? Don't just talk to me about the consequences of what you're doing. Don't just talk to me about the promises about what you're doing. Don't just talk to me about, oh, this is going to make your life great. That's all well and good. But do you have the authority to do what you're doing? They, 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 when they arrogate to themselves the power to mess, mess with election law, you're, you're taking power to yourself that actually the Constitution gives to whom? Whom does the Constitution give authority to to regulate uh, how elections are to be conducted state by state? The state legislatures. The state legislatures. And so whether it's that or whether it's in regard to this, that it's the Congress that has the authority over the debt, not the executive branch. And no, there's no obligation there to keep raising the debt ceiling. There just isn't. And, you know, finally here, we'll go back into 
prayer. A lot of people talk about double standard. And again, going back to Dan Bongino, whom I know a lot of you listen to, as do I, uh, he's making this point all the time. We talk about double standard. We talk about hypocrisy. And you look at the Democrats and you've got a lot of things that they do that, that, that deserve uh, those names or at least bring those words to our lips and to our minds. But it's actually not that. It's not hypocrisy and it's not a double standard. You look at the way they treat, you know, uh, the Trump team, people like Peter Navarro, Steve Bannon, a way on the other hand that they, they don't deal with their own people and the corruption and the whatever they want to call it. It's one standard. It's not a double standard. It's one. It's a single standard. Tyranny. Hierarchy. Power. They have the power, and therefore they feel, what well, they can do what they want. That's what we have to shine the light on. They couldn't care less about being perceived to have a double standard or being hypocrites. We've got to call them out on what this really is. Tyrannical power grabbing. That's what it is. It's hierarchy. I'm in charge, and I'm going to let you know I'm in charge because I'm going to I'm going to do things that you're going to say. Oh, that's not fair. They don't care if it's not fair. They don't even care if it looks fair. And this is the arrogation of power that we've got to stop. This is what we've got to put a stop to. This is why President Trump is coming in here now with his campaign and saying we're going to return power to you, the people. That's the whole thrust of everything he says and does. And that's why, you know, when the left is saying, complaining about something about us, calling, for example, President Trump a, a dictator or a tyrant himself, my goodness, you look at what they're saying, they're talking about themselves. You look at what they're accusing Republicans of doing or President Trump of doing, switch it around because they are talking exactly about what they do and they're talking exactly about what we should be uh, uh, complaining about to them not the other way around. They're the tyrants, not us. On our side of the, uh, of, of the aisle here, it's all about returning power to the people. That's what is part and parcel, key, fundamental to making America great again. And that conforms to the word of God. Talk about power to the people. What is it in our Christian belief that speaks of power to the people? Let me finish with this thought and we'll go back to prayer. It's very simply that we have become sons and daughters of God. We're not just human beings. We're sons and daughters of God. As St. Peter says in the New Testament, we share the divine nature. As Jesus said, I will come to you, we will come to you, the Father, the Holy Spirit. We will make our dwelling in you. Paul says, Do you, are you not aware that Christ Jesus is living in you? We share in the life of God. Talk about power. We can believe, we can hope, we can love in ways that go beyond human strength. Jesus can give us commandments that seem humanly impossible. Love your enemy, pray for your persecutor, carry your cross, be detached from all your possessions. He, he, he requires things of us that are like, are you kidding? How can I even do this? Yeah, we can do it because we're not relying on human strength. We, we have power from above. Stay behind, he said, after when he was about to ascend into heaven. Stay in the city and wait until you are clothed with power from on high. What power is he talking about? The Holy Spirit. That's why I always say Christianity itself revolutionized politics. It's the basis for having a representative form of government where the voice of the people matters. What's the basis of that? The people matter because God has taken them up into his own life. He's given us dignity just by creating us, but he's increased that dignity even more by bestowing his spirit on us, by bestowing his life on us, by making us his sons and daughters. Of course our voice matters. Power to the people? Yes. This is where the political message of breaking tyranny and claiming the power again to govern ourselves is so consistent with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This Word of God is power to the people more than anything else in human history could ever be. And that's why our faith and our political convictions here 
are so consistent one with the other. Let's pray. Father, we come before you as acknowledge the power you give us by raising us up in Christ. Power, Lord God, that belongs really to every human being. And that's why we're so concerned about human beings at the very beginning of their existence, because somehow they seem to be just dropped out of the equation of protection. Take these babies in the womb and it's just like no power to them, but they should have power too. We were all there and they share the same nature as we do. Power to the people. Help us, Lord. Make America great by pointing out to our fellow citizens that defeating the Democrats is not just about one or another issue. Defeating the Democrats this year is about preserving freedom, resisting tyranny. Lord, we ask that awaken our fellow citizens to the the lies and the just the, the erroneous concepts, all the falsehoods that this party spouts about the Constitution, about their authority. Lord, they don't know what they're talking about. Thank you that we do. It's not because we're better. It's because we're paying attention by your grace. We're paying attention to the very words of that document. We're paying attention to the history of our nation, and we're paying attention to what is good for our nation. So thank you, Lord, for that grace, that insight. Thank you for the blessing you give us of always, always being able to follow you, being able to discern your will, being able to articulate the beauty of your truth. Bless us now as we move forward in this election. Bless us that we may mobilize other voters, that we may educate them. Give us always the strength to speak up and to show people what is at stake. Lord, we pray for one another too. We, among all our viewers right now, those that are sorrowful, we ask you to bring consolation. Those that are doubtful, we ask you to bring clarity so that they may make important decisions. Those who are far away from the faith, bring them back. Those who are repenting of sin, give them your forgiveness. Those who need health, Lord God, restore full health and strength. Those who need you in any other way, provide what they need. We sum up all our prayers and praises now and our hope for America by offering the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, good to be with you. Listen, there's some people only you can reach. Would you let them know about praying for America? Only you can reach certain people. We're publicizing it all the time. RSBN publicizes it. But there's some people only you can reach who I'm sure would be, you would know, would be interested in this program. We appreciate your efforts to help us continue to grow our online audience, which is growing, and I'm grateful to you for that. All right. We'll see you tomorrow. God bless you. Please know that we're praying for you. And check out our main website at Priest for Life at endabortion.us. Uh, Pro-Life leader Frank Pavone here. God bless you. Talk to you soon. Hello, this is Abby Johnson of Unplanned the Movie. You know me as a longtime supporter of Priest for Life and of Father Frank Pavone. And I just want to encourage you as someone who knows of the great work of this organization, please continue to stand strong. Please continue to support this mission. It is so needed now more than ever. Thank you so much for all of your support. Follow him, Father Frank Pavone, F.R. Frank Pavone. He is the National Director of Priests for Life. Please go to priestsforlife.org. Frank Pavone. Frank, thank you very much.